In Sebastian Latou's final year in Philadelphia, the 2016 Union would sneak into the playoffs, then immediately get bounced by Toronto 3-1. That failure, and that of this broader middle era of the Union, had an attached lesson, one the Union seemed to have already learned. In the years where Philadelphia's basketball team, the 76ers, were midway through the process of tanking to earn high draft picks and build a superstar-rich team, the Union did something similar. Something that was likely already known and that the failure of Rice and Bali proved was that if the Union tried to play the same game as big market clubs who could make big signings with impunity, they would always lose. The Union instead focused on growth from the youth system. By 2018, there were already results. The closest thing we have to an inflection point that leads to the era that would define the Union in the 2020s, including today, came in the middle of the 2018 season. Like so many other parts of this story, it comes with an echo of the past. On the day that the Vancouver Whitecaps visited town, Sebastian Latou signed a one-day contract to officially retire a Union player. That day he was unveiled as the club's first ever Ring of Honor player, and did they ever live up to his mark on that day. In what I will forever refer to as the Philly Lona game, where the Union dominated possession with 90% pass completion, the blue and gold dismantled the White Cavs 4-0, including two from Borek Dochka, a one-year loan piece. The defense in that game was held down by Austin Trusty and Mark McKenzie, two outstanding homegrown players. That season, the Union would feature in the playoffs once again, although they were dismantled by NYCFC, and just for fun made another U.S. Open Cup final before getting destroyed 3-0 by Houston. In 2019, they would finally contend. In the third minute, the captain comes up with a very big goal. Hey, Congress, do something now! End gun violence, let's go! Alejandro Bedoya joined the Union right in 2016 as things took a step back and became a captain one year later in 2017. His leadership and character, along with playmaking ability, will lead the Union right out of their dark times and into the era of contention. They played New York Red Bulls in the first round of the 2019 playoffs, and instantly they went off to a bad start. They went down 2-0 within 25 minutes, until Ale Bedoya's first time strike brought one back. Defying the comeback, the Red Bulls pulled out another two-goal lead at the end of the first half on a defensive blunder on a free kick. Jack Elliott, the towering English defender whose career had started in Sunday leagues and who had joined the roster in 2017, had finally found regular playing time in 2019, and here he swoops in to head in the second goal off a rebound. The Union were now on the front foot and in desperate need of the equalizer, pulling out all the stops with offensively minded subs in Fafa Pico and El Sino, two men who had been with the club for years as super subs. El Sino, a one-time Brazil international who once scored against Barcelona in the Champions League as part of Shakhtar Donetsk, and who was sent off against Red Bulls just hours after his Union transfer announcement, had sparked a three-goal comeback against New York earlier in the regular season. But today, it was Fafa Pico's time to shine. The relatively short 5'8 forward rose highest and headed home the equalizer, and kept running rampant, almost getting the winner himself at the last moments of stoppage time but it would have to be an extra time. Minutes after his introduction, Fabian became the man of the hour. He would not spend too much time with the Union and would leave a spotty legacy in his wake, but here is what he's remembered for. His shot would deflect and chip over the hapless keeper and end up in the back of the net. With a 4-3 lead and a crazy match, nothing would be easy, but they would eventually hold on. The first playoff win in Philadelphia Union history had been written on a rainy night in Chester in front of 18,000. The 
fairly comprehensive semifinal defeat in the next match to defending champs Atlanta did nothing to dull the spark. The 2020 Union would add Jakob Glesnes, another towering defender, to sit alongside Elliot, and Jose Martinez, El Rujo, the uncompromising yet creative deep-sitting midfielder. The club also purchased Jamiro Montero full-time off an option on his loan. 2020 would also be, among many other things, the Brendan Aronson year. The man they call the Medford Messi would announce himself as the best ever homegrown player in the club's history. He would impress to the extent that, at just 20 years old, he would transfer out to Red Bull Salzburg in Austria and later would feature in the U.S.'s 2022 World Cup effort. Katzper Shabilka also played his first full season in blue and gold, albeit in a COVID-shortened campaign. All of these pieces, plus Kai Wagner and Sergio Santos, will come together to create the best team thus far in Union history. They scored more goals than any other MLS team that season, but without a single player in the MLS top scorers list. Instead, Shabilko and Santos would top out the club at eight goals each, and Anthony Fontana, a homegrown talent who had been listed as a substitute back in the 2018 campaign, had a breakout year with six goals of his own. Brendan Aronson led the team with seven assists. The Union also gave up fewer goals than anyone else in the league, with the Glesnes Elliott McKenzie backline holding firm in front of Andre Blake. Back in 2014, the Union drafted the Jamaican first overall in the college to MLS Super Draft, reminiscent of the first overall pick used on Bob Rigby. 41 years earlier. Blake was on the roster back when the Union made their misguided signing of the hapless Mboli, but he was the real keeper of the future. He had won 2016 Keeper of the Year honors, but he continued developing, and over the coming years he became more calculated and made fewer mistakes, and eventually fulfilled his potential as the best keeper in the MLS. It's hard to quantify a keeper's impact, but I'm going to try for Andre Blake. The stat XG for expected goals measures the quality of a shot by the probability that it results in a goal, assuming average players on the pitch. A hypothetical shot of 1 XG implies a literally certain goal, while a shot of 0.5 XG implies a shot expected to go in half of the time. A penalty kick is worth 0.79 XG because those go in approximately 79% of the time. If you add up the XG of the shots that a team takes over the course of a game, you get a rough estimate for how many goals they should have gotten. If you add up the total XG of the opponent's shots over the course of a season, you get an estimate for how many goals a team should have given up over the whole campaign. XG can of course vary from your actual tally of goals, and sometimes it's based on luck, game by game. For example, in this recent 3-3 draw between Man City and Tottenham, where City's XG was dramatically higher than Hotspur's, but they got unlucky by hitting the post multiple times on several high-value shots. When your XG systematically varies over multiple seasons, it reveals skill. If a very good keeper is stopping high-quality opportunities that might otherwise have scored, your XG against, XGA, will be higher than the actual amount of goals you conceded. The Union in 2020 and in every year since have had higher XGA than actual goals allowed, thanks in large part to Andre Blake, who has been the main keeper over that stretch, only missing significant time in 2023. Over those four seasons, the Union's XGA has been 151.6. With an average keeper, they would be expected to have conceded around 151 or 152 goals. With Blake playing the majority of time in net, they conceded 122. In 2020, Andre Blake would win the MLS Keeper of the Year award for a second time, and the Union, after dispatching New England Revolution 2-0 with Brendan Aronson wearing the captain's armband on that day, would finish top of the table. Under another torrential downpour on the banks of the Delaware, the Union would finally lift their first piece of silverware, the Supporter Shield. Since the actual shield could not be shipped in from Los Angeles in time, a vinyl wrap would be applied to a Captain America costume shield 
that a local supporter volunteered, and that would be the shield lifted on that day. It wasn't typical in a year that was anything but, but for a team whose story hasn't been typical either, it was fitting. In an ironic twist, though, this team would fall 2-0 to the same Revolution side that they clinched the shield against in just their first playoff game of the season. It was disappointing, but it was to be just the beginning of the present era of Union history, the era of contention. Back in South Philly, the 76ers' process of tearing down to build through the draft was never meant to just end with a strong team built from high draft pick players. The final stage was always to use the strong foundation to entice a superstar free agent to sign for the team. While that process sputtered entering the new decade, the union's progress adopted a similar end goal. In the MLS, it is great to have strong homegrown talent, but anytime a young homegrown player seriously impresses, clubs from European leagues more prestigious than the MLS are likely to come around and throw money at you to purchase those players off your roster. After 2020, this happened, and both Mark McKenzie and Brendan Aronson were purchased by clubs in Belgium and Austria, respectively. The same had happened earlier to Austin Trusty, who was first purchased by Colorado Rapids before heading over to the English Premier League. But much like the process, strong homegrown talent was never the final goal. Using the money they earned from these transfers, they were able to get Daniel Gazdag. The Hungarian international would prove to be the best outfield player in the Union's roster for years to come, at some points making an MVP case for himself. They also brought in Leon Flock and Jesus Bueno, as well as calling up young talents in Nathan Harriel and Jack McGlynn. The Union would slump to begin the year, but they got hot down the stretch, losing only one of their last 11 to get into the playoffs. As good as they were, the Union in 2021 were prone to the occasional off night on offense. Against New York Red Bulls in the first round of the playoffs, this would occur and it would be the defense that had to hold firm. And they did just that, holding the Red Bulls scoreless as the game ticked into the 123rd minute. As the last Union chance across dissolved, the game seemed destined for penalty kicks. Jakob Glesnes, with other ideas, got the ball from 30 yards out and with the entire stadium urging him to shoot, looped a half volley into the bottom corner. Game over. The Union would move on to the conference semifinal. There, they welcomed Nashville. After a beautiful cross and clinical header gave Nashville the lead via Hani Mukhtar, Daniel Gazdag came to the rescue, bringing the crowd back to life with a second chance shot off a deflection. The Union would press for more, including the skull ruled out by referee Alan Chapman for a foul, but they again could not break through, and penalties ensued. I watched this game live on my phone in the college cafeteria during dinner, and I remember it like it was yesterday. Hani Mukhtar, the goal scorer and Nashville's best player, steps up, and on their very first shot, Andre Blake imposes himself and makes a stop. Jack Elliott, a member of that rock-solid back line, comes up and buries the Union's first penalty. Next, Nashville's Anibal Godoy comes up, and Andre Blake once again reaches out and tips the shot wide. Sergio Santos misses, and Alex Muil comes up. Blake once again guesses the right way, and Muil has to adjust and ends up missing the frame entirely. Jack McGlynn, the homegrown talent, comes up and nails it ice in his veins. Scranton, you say, huh? Even Dunder Mifflin is proud of this. By the way, you know who that is, cracking wise about Dunder Mifflin in the commentary box? That's Alejandro Moreno, the same player who fed Latou in on goal all the way back at the link in 2010 for his second goal, and the one who drew the foul that led to Latou's legendary free kick winner. Anyway, after that goal... It's just a Walker Zimmerman miss, and the Union moved on to the conference finals with a bizarre 2-0 shootout win. It's the highest we'd ever been, the closest we'd ever been to winning the MLS Cup. And everyone knew this would be the year. The supporter shield holders and perennial Union beaters New England Revolution had been dumped out by a relatively weak NYCFC side. 
and over in the west it was Upset City as every top team went down. Then, the sky fell worse than for any MLS team in history. Eleven players, including Blake and Ale Bedoya, would be ruled out of the conference final under the MLS COVID safety protocols. Jack Elliott and Jakob Lesnes would be out as well, forcing the Union to face their opponent with a severely depleted defense. They held their own, and they even scored first, but squandered the lead within two minutes. In the last minutes, Olivier Baizo made a mistake, and it was game over for the Union. As NYCFC took the place the Union might otherwise have occupied in the MLS final, they took full advantage, beating a Portland team that the Union had demolished 3-0 in their only meeting that year. NYC won the MLS Cup, but the long shadow of the so-called 11 men out game looms large over the path they took to get there. The third successive year of best Union campaign was over. Why not add a fourth? The club, left wanting more after the loss in 21, reshaped the offense. Shibilko, Santos, and Montero were all transferred out, and the club turned around and used that money to sign Mikkel Ua from Danish champions Brondby and Julian Carranza on a loan from Inter Miami that would later become permanent. With this new attacking duo in to help out Gazdag, the Union would score 72 goals, by far the most in team history, while only conceding 26, by far the fewest in team history in a full season, and just six more than the 2020 Supporter Shield team that played 11 fewer games. Those 26 goals were against the post-shot XJF 36, meaning Blake's contribution saved roughly 10 goals over the course of the season and he unsurprisingly earned his record third MLS Goalkeeper of the Year award. These union never once lost at home, and should have been the Supporters' Shield winners, having tied on points with LAFC and having a far superior goal difference. But because LAFC had more wins, playing in an extremely weak Western Conference, they got the award instead. In the playoffs, they held a Cincinnati side with three former union members on the roster at bay in a 1-0 win. Then they were back in the conference finals against NYCFC, again. This time, the Union were on the front foot for a sustained period of time. They had a goal ruled out for an offsides and kept pushing, but New York ended up with the first goal from Maxi Morales. Then Andre Blake had to make an amazing close range save to prevent the deficit from going out to two. Minutes later, a crafty free kick allowed Carranza to equalize, and five minutes after that, Carranza fed Gazdag with a smart header to go one up. And in the 75th minute, off the boot of super sub Corey Burke, it was game over. At a 3-1 margin, the Union righted the wrongs of the 11 men out debacle. For the first time in club history, they would play the MLS Cup. Coming out of the Western Conference were the Union's polar opposites, LAFC. LA had emerged out of the ground in the wake of the demise of Chivas USA and were immediately flush with cash, enough to instantly make big transfers for the likes of Carlos Vela and Diego Rossi, the former of whom was still on the team in 2022 and was a big piece for LA in their 2022 campaign. Other key signings like Kellen Acosta, Christian Arango, and Brian Rodriguez also played huge roles in 2022. Whereas the Union built through the MLS's best homegrown player system that would produce talent to sell off and use that money for big transfers, LAFC were able to skip step one and go straight to big signings, with the cash left over to sign some retiring legends in Giorgio Chiellini and Gareth Bale just for fun. LAFC would play the game at home, again with more wins as the deciding tiebreaker, and use the home atmosphere to their advantage going up early through a Kellen Acosta deflected goal, and the Union would go into the half down 1-0. Coming out of the half, they possessed the ball, and the mercurial Jose Martinez got the ball and dribbled past the defender about 35 yards out. One of El Brujo's more polarizing traits is his hair trigger from this kind of range. He seems to constantly be making attempts from long distance, but most of these shots don't even hit the frame. When he appears to wind up for another crack in the 59th minute, LAFC defenders freeze, expecting the shot, 
and are left completely flat-footed as the ball instead feeds Gazdag, who finds the equalizer. The next 20 minutes pass largely without incident, then Jesus Murillo gives the lead back to LA on this agonizingly accurate header that crosses the face of goal out of reach of Blake. The Union, with 8 minutes plus stoppage to save their MLS Cup lives, move quickly and end up with a free kick in an attacking location. With the towering Glesnes and Jack Elliott, the Union have always been set-piece threats, and Wagner sends it in, with Elliott coming free from his defender and putting the ball right into the near post to equalize a second time. The extra 30 minutes beckoned, and the Union were better. In the 110th minute with the game still tied, LAFC's Murillo makes an all-time hospital pass and allows the Union's Corey Burke to streak in and take the ball, but keeper Maxime Crapeau comes out and makes a last-ditch sliding challenge and collects Berg, committing a red card denial of goal-scoring opportunity foul and in the process breaking his leg. The backup keeper for LAFC is forced to come on and it'll be another echo of the past. John McCarthy, the Union's own homegrown talent from Philadelphia who came on after the Mboli debacle, but who remained second option as Blake developed into the MLS's best keeper. After his homegrown contract was over, he became a journeyman and ended up with LAFC, and here he was to face his home club. The Union, a man up, pressed for the winner. A cross deflected off Carranza and McCarthy made one of the biggest reaction saves in MLS Cup history only for the rebound to be put back into the net by Jack Elliott. The defender had scored an unlikely brace and was the hero of the match if the Union could hold on against 10-man LAFC. However, nothing could be simple for this club. With just two minutes left to hold on, LAFC broke out down the wing towards the touchline off a throw-in, and a cutback cross in the air came into the box. Gareth Bale, a broken-down legend at 33 years of age, who was playing in his last-ever club match at the time, who would retire after the 2022 World Cup that would immediately follow this game, jumps in the air to reach the ball. Jack Elliott, the two-goal hero of the Union, who had held them through the game in defense and offense, jumps up to contest it. Gareth Bale gets his head to it first, and the ball spears past Blake and into the net, for a shocking equalizer to send the game to penalties. There, it would be the penalty specialist, McCarthy, against MLS's best all-around keeper. Blake opened the shootout with a save from Teo, and you can see the relief on his face, perhaps wondering if it was going to be another Nashville, with all opponent takers missing. But Gazdag, after an MVP-level season where he led the Union to the MLS Cup, lost his footing on the chopped up turf and missed high. Dennis Boanga scored, and then the penalty specialist came into his own. Way back in 2015, in the penalty shootout where the Union lost the MLS Open Cup to SKC with McCarthy in goal, he already had great instincts but was impetuous, and got frustrated every single time he guessed right but couldn't stop the shot, even when the penalty was completely out of reach. Seven years later, McCarthy had become patient, and he would make two great saves from Martinez and Wagner while Blake couldn't keep LAFC out. Elie Sanchez steps up, and as his shot flies past Blake, the greatest game in MLS history was over, and the Union had lost. This loss stung, much worse than the 11 men out debacle. Worse than perhaps all three Open Cup final losses put together. You can trace back the factors that led to the loss, from the blown defense in the final third that allowed Jack Elliott to get out-leaped by a 33-year-old Gareth Bale, to the deflection that led to LFC's first, all the way back to the janky, only seen in MLS use of wins as a first tiebreak that denied the Union both the supporter shield and the right to host the final at home. And you could pretty easily get upset. But at the end of the day, the past is written. Even in circumstances more heartbreaking than possibly any other MLS loss, the call is the same as ever for the Union. Learn from this. We have to learn from this. We have to learn and we have to come back better, because when you lose, what else is there to do?
then pick yourself up and fight to be better in the future. Jim Curtin in the post-match sounded understandably shell-shocked, but his most salient quote is recorded in The Athletic. Said the longest tenured coach in the MLS, the most important thing is to keep this group together. We are close, and we can win an MLS Cup, but just today wasn't meant to be. In the 2023 season, the most recent at time of recording, the team did take a step back, understandable after the heights of 22 and the way it ended. They did make it into the playoffs and would finally take care of business against their recurring thorn in the side, New England Revolution, but would fall out of the playoffs after a loss to Cincinnati. This story certainly does have sad moments, but it is not by any means a tragedy. Even without the silverware this team may have won had some things gone slightly different, there is still a resounding joy. Take it from the real soccer culture that the team has sparked in the city. Take it from the players for whom Philadelphia was already home and who developed in the youth system and then made it abroad and onto the national team. And take joy also from the players who found a home here, like Latou who still lives and broadcasts from here, but also for Shane and Williams, who returned to help run a boys team in the Philadelphia area. For Ale Moreno, who spent one season here in the middle of a long career and who still reflects fondly on his time in blue and gold. For Gabriel Farfan, born in San Diego, who nevertheless found a home in the Union, playing alongside his brother. For Cleberson, who had only played 11 games here but began his coaching career as an assistant in the development program. And for Farid Mondragon, who had played since long before the Union even existed and only spent one year in Philadelphia, and who still felt such a warmth here that he ended up wanting to retire with the Union an aspiration which the early Union front office unfortunately did deny him. I understand that I am biased, that this is my team, and that I will always find more in this story than a neutral or someone who doesn't follow sports. Being able to trace my own experiences of these moments in time with their occurrence in this story, but I truly believe the Union have something of value, something to draw on in the willingness and ability to grow and learn from their mistakes, something to admire and the capacity to create a home for anyone whose path brings them here, and something eminently relatable in those repeated instances where their finest efforts bring them agonizingly close to their ambitions, but they fall short in the end. Sometimes we like to see ourselves in the best of the best, especially when it's done on our behalf, but quite often we can relate more to a Bajo or to a Marta. Not tragic figures, but one whose stories carry tragic elements who achieve massive but never complete success. The Union offer up an even more real story, one with steady improvement and with rich contours of a dream start in dark times, periods of non-contention and near misses nested within, success marked by failures that break your heart, and always a belief in learning from the past. The Union's story is vividly aspirational because if and when they do reach the mountaintop, it will be because of the winding path they took, not in spite of it. In the middle of the 2023 season, the Union were playing Orlando City away and went down 2-0. Play on the road was the Achilles heel for this Union squad all year. Here in June, it seemed like another road loss until Jack McGlynn scored on this cross that the keeper misjudged and suddenly the Union were pushing for an equalizer. Late on, with the time running out in the 90th minute, a cross was rebuffed and the ball bounced out to Jose Martinez. El Brujo, the wizard, had been with the team since 2020, and he's never been perfect, with a penchant for yellow cards and silly fouls, and the aforementioned tendency to shoot wildly from range. But he has continuously improved his play and become a star as a deep-sitting midfielder and he will be the only player to represent the Union at the MLS All-Star Game in 2023. As the ball caroms out towards him, he winds up for yet another shot. He's never once scored in the MLS, but he's going to try it again. In netting the equalizer from that range, Martinez would completely redeem all of his prior missed attempts. With this shot, Martinez teaches the same lesson the Union have done across their 15 years. He kept trying, 
and kept improving, and it finally worked out, better than his wildest dreams or expectations. That is the Philadelphia Union. Thanks for watching.